We begin by praising Allah and asking to send peace and blessings to all of His prophets, including the last of all of them, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And today, Islam is much misrepresented on the media. And Islam is uh, being misrepresented and misunderstood uh, largely uh, due to the actions of some Muslims who have uh, either committed terrorist acts in the name of Islam or have propounded some such ideas that cause non-Muslims to have fears and misgivings about what Islam and Muslims are all about. In response to that, uh, we have on the one hand some Muslims who would deny any sort of involvement from any other Muslim, as if we know every Muslim in the world and we know that no Muslim ever does any, anything wrong. Of course, such a denial is not reasonable. On the other hand, many of us, most of us, are just simply bewildered. We, as, as our non-Muslims, are bewildered. Uh, we find it puzzling to think that anyone, whether Muslim or not, could commit such atrocities. Who would, whether individual or government, or whatever forces, or whatever secret organizations, would commit such atrocities on human beings? Who would commit an act like the 9-11 of uh, 2001? Who would bomb the London subways? Why would anyone commit such carnage? We're all bewildered. Non-Muslims are bewildered. Muslims are especially bewildered because we're asking, how do people do such things in the name of Islam? Because we know Islam to be peaceful. We are peaceful people. And we're wondering, how could anyone have misused the name of Islam for such violence? Well, we should try to come to grips with that. We should try to understand it ourselves uh, so that we can, of course, represent it properly to others. There are a number of factors that, in fact, have contributed to the rise of terrorism. And terrorism, of course, has many shades, many colors, and they come from many different angles. Uh, somebody in the United States of America, Robert Pape, has written a book entitled Dying to Win, in which uh, he has traced the history of terrorism and he has uh, looked specifically at the phenomenon of suicide bombings. And he has shown in this book, in fact, that suicide bombings are not uh, limited to Islam, and that in fact uh, the suicide vest was invented by someone outside of the Muslim community prior to us hearing about this coming uh, from the side of Muslims. So there is much more to be understood. Many people ask, why are Muslims so filled with rage? And uh, the fact is that not all Muslims are filled with rage. Most Muslims are like most other people. They go to work, they try to make two ends meet, they try to pay their bills. Most Muslims want what most other people want. They want to have a, a good life in this life. They want to have a, a nice family. They want people to love and they want to be loved. Uh, they want some sort of financial security or at least well-being so that they do not have to worry about where the next meal will come from. But in addition to all of that, Muslims have to hope in Allah that they will have a blessed life in the life hereafter. They will have an everlasting life in paradise with Allah. Jalla. But in terms of living in this life, Muslims and non-Muslims will look much the same. Of course, Muslims will, will have a different sort of appearance that represents the Sunnah of the Prophet in, in most uh, ways. But apart from that, in terms of behavior, we want the same things, we approach the same things. And uh, in terms of peace, I see no difference there between Muslims wanting peace and non-Muslims uh, wanting peace. So we should understand then that there are some Muslims who are angry at certain world situations. Many Muslims are angry because of the way the Palestinians have been treated. Many Muslims are angry because the Kashmiris have not been given the right to self-determination. Many Muslims are angry because injustice has been done to Muslims in many parts of the world. Many Muslims are angry because we feel powerless. We sometimes feel that it is hopeless. No justice will be done to us. We have no power to, to change any of that. And the powers that have the power to change that are being controlled by other bigger powers who might be the source of some of the injustice to begin with. So it seems to be a vicious circle. 
Some Muslims are in fact turning to the Quran and to Islamic history. They're looking at the life of the Prophet ﷺ and they're calling what they need to justify their actions. And anyone can do this. Anyone can go to the Bible or to any other sacred scripture or non-sacred scripture. Anyone can go to any book and find what they need, pick things out of context, make it read the, one, the way they want to read, make it read, and then they can justify their actions on that basis. So what is needed for us now is to study the Quran and the life example of the Prophet ﷺ carefully to understand two things. To understand how these sources are being misused in order to justify violence, whether by those who commit violence or by those who want to taint the image of Islam by insisting that Islam is a violent religion. And on the other hand, to understand now how to combat these misunderstandings how to correct these misappropriations uh, of the verses and about the examples in the life, uh, life history of the Prophet So very quickly, let us uh, look at the way in which the Prophet conducted himself. I want to, in, in 10 minutes, just look at the broad uh, scope of, of the prophetic career of our Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, because only by understanding his prophetic career can we understand what the verses of the Quran are speaking about. Now the Prophet Wasallam, was born in Makkah in the year 570. That was the year of the elephant. When he was about 40 years old he began receiving revelations. That was the year 610. Now the revelations that came to him for the next 30 years or so were known, uh, are come to be known now as the Makkah revelations. Those are verses of the Quran that were revealed to him during the time that he remained in Makkah in his hometown. Then the Prophet ﷺ migrated to Medina, where he set up what would be called now an Islamic state. He was the virtual uh, re ruler of the region. And verses that came down to him in that period for the next 10 years until he went back to meet his Lord are referred to as the Medinan verses because they came in the phase when he was in Medina. So we have the Quran being comprised of two sets of verses. And these verses are sometimes intermingled. In a single surah of the Quran you may have some Mantan verses and you may have some Medinan verses. But for the large part they are also separate. We have some surahs which are particularly known to be Madinan surahs. You have Surah uh, Al-Anfal, for example, Surah 8, and uh, Surah Al-Tawbah, Surah 9, or Surah 